Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and we're talking about community matters with David and, and Tice Vogel. Uh, they're here in town, and they are co-founders of the Volo Foundation, uh, which is a private family foundation that exists to educate the public. We're going to do that now to create a sustainable and secure planet for generations to come. What's more is that this is an attempt to achieve positive change for the planet through data-driven research. And David is a data-driven scientist. I mean, he's a driven scientist who likes data. Did I get that right, David? That's right. <laughs> welcome to the show, David. Tice, welcome to the show. <laughs> so you have some slides and there's some things you wanna impart. And I wanna give you the opportunity to talk about Volo Foundation, um, talk about its work and uh, talk about the climate change uh, science and conclusions that, that we need to know, okay? Well, Voter Foundation uh, started in 2014 in, down in Florida. We live in Florida, but Dave was born in Hawaii. That's why we have so much interest in coming here and sharing our knowledge with you all. And I always say that people that know us, we're very different. Dave is a data scientist. He uh, is the one that talks to that community. I'm more of the everyday mother of six that talks to the everyday people. So we become a bridge between the science and the everyday people. <laughs> That's perfect, perfect. <laughs> That's the way you have to do it, right? Otherwise there's too much, too much distance between the science and everyday life. So uh, the science is very interesting to me. You guys have a, a regular newsletter. You, uh, you publish articles. Uh, you encourage others to write articles and do research on this. You are really um, getting more and more active in the area and it requires that. Unfortunately, we are distracted in recent months with COVID, but you haven't stopped. I noticed that you keep on, you keep on going and you keep on doing your work and publishing your findings. Uh, so David, what, you know, what, what have you been learning uh, what can you tell us today? What do your slides show um, about uh, creating a sustainable and se secure planet? Uh, it's really important. We can never forget it. I think it's important for people to realize the connection between climate change and the, the effects on our economy. Um, that, because consistently, economy ranks number one on the issues. Climate change ranks somewhere down there, depending on on, on the group, uh, but it's so closely tied uh, to the economy, and, and we have to. And what we do is we we draw the relationship between each ton of carbon we produce and the damage it creates, um, both economically and, and to our health. And so that's really what the research shows us. And I think if it can be, be presented correctly, there are certain certainly policies, uh, many many different policies that can work to um, to uh, to to uh, prevent further change in the climate and change in our temperature. Yeah, so policies, you're, by policies, you're really talking about government policies uh, yeah. because that's where the leadership must come from. And today, I think we're gonna focus on uh, carbon policies and um, carbon, the benefits of carbon policies. And uh, I'd like to hear uh, your most current thinking about that. Uh, we have some states that are actually entertaining a carbon tax, and maybe there's other incentives you can tell us about. It's all about incentivizing the change of human conduct. That's the way we, we can save the planet. Um, and it seems like if you look at it from an economic point of view, um, it's, it's monetary um, uh, policies, uh, monetary incentives, like a tax or a credit, whatever. Uh, so tell us your latest thinking. Well, in order to stay um, non partisan on this, um, we, we sort of present a spectrum of policies. So certainly there's the, the carbon tax, which you probably hear a lot about, but, but many are, um, many object to an additional tax. Um, there's also the idea of, of carbon fee, carbon dividends, uh, where the, um, the polluters are charged a fee for every ton for basically the damage that's being done and that money is given back to the public. So it's not an additional tax on, on, on households, but a tax on the, on the actual polluters. Mm -hmm. and, and what that does economically, it actually patches an inefficiency 
in our economy uh, where polluters can actually do more damage than the actual profits they produce. And if you can actually catch that efficiency, it makes that, that one carbon pricing policy can actually fix everything because, because capitalism is very powerful. When, once you price in the correct, the correct cost of, um, of carbon, then all of a sudden the clean energy becomes more competitive and you don't have to do this and that with incentives and caps and, and all, all this reg, regulation. So the free market can actually solve itself if you, if you make it efficient. Well, I, mean, I know we, we're going to go through the slides, but a couple of things come to mind. Number one is um, um, a, a tax uh, would be across the board. And that means a tax would be regressive on people who don't have a lot of money. Uh, these days, uh, we're interested in what you would call a social justice. That's uh, you know a fundamental piece of uh, all the movement around the country. Um, and query, what do you say to the people who say, David, uh, a carbon tax is regressive? because it affects everybody the same way and some people are better able to pay it than others. What do you say to that? Well, I'd say there's a lot of adjustments that can be made. There's, pr there's probably half a dozen policies that have been proposed and some uh, more, some regressive, some more progressive. And that's really something for the politicians to work out to make it fair. And, and certainly we're in, in favor of something that is socially fair, uh, but the, but the fact of the matter is, it doesn't actually matter uh, where the um, like the exact economics of, of where the, of where the money is going, for example, is not actually important in solving climate change. It's actually just that just the the fact that the pollution is charged is is the whole in the in in making the economy work. And just so just the fact that there, that pollution is charged actually fixes fixes the problem. So these are you're other creating issues. a damage day. I mean, you cannot go and destroy the house and not pay for it. They, the polluters, the big companies are creating this damage that at the end of the day, we, the constituents are paying for it because every time that we have to recuperate from a damage, the hurricanes and the droughts and the California fires, we are paying out of our taxes. Yes. So people don't understand that they are already paying for it instead of paying for a tax because they don't like the word tax. Let's charge the real polluters. Right. Well, yes, and, and it, it's only fair if you're looking for fairness, as David pointed out. Um, you, want to, you want to assign the burden to the people who have, pro, have, have, have emitted um, most of the carbon, you know, so it should be proportional. To the amount of carbon that that you are responsible for emitting. I'm sorry, David. You were saying. Yeah. So. Um, uh, so. So basically, um, it, it's it's like I can't. Um, well, I'll give you a stat, a statistic that's pretty mind blowing. If you look at, at just the, the last decade, uh, the the um, the net profit of the oil and gas industry was 850 billion dollars. Uh, the climate damage is done was $1 trillion. So we're actually at a point with the emissions where the damages to the public exceeds the amount of economic gain. Mm. So it's a negative, and, and yet you don't subtract from GDP when, uh, when there's damages done. So it looks like our GDP is growing, and yet people have less and less, and you ask why, that, that's why. We're, we're spending tax dollar monies to, for, for climate damages. Uh, there's huge numbers. How do you quantify the incentive or the disincentive, the tax, whatever mechanism you're going to use? That sounds like something for a data scientist, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, there's actually um, many, many more scientists than I working on this, on that very problem. And there are specialists working in different areas, quantifying storm damages, quantifying uh, medical costs. Um, in different parts of the world, uh, quantifying the cost of droughts. And so collectively within, if, if you were to add up what all these specialists have, have come up with, it could be on the order of as much as $200 per ton of carbon. Well, that's, we, we need to change conduct. And I suppose the fringe benefit is this will give uh, government some money to spend uh, in ameliorating climate change on the other side of the, the question. So it's a win-win. 
as far as that's concerned. But you know, it strikes me that if you want to create a sustainable and secure planet using carbon incentives, uh, carbon policy uh, and the benefits, um, you have to do it on a global basis. You, you're not, you, you don't wanna just limit it to one area, one country, uh, even one continent. You wanna, you wanna go as far and wide as you possibly can. Am I right about that? Is that the way you guys address it? You are correct. It, it does have to be global. And uh, if you get into the details of some of these proposed policies, they have border adjustments. Um, ah, so well, first, first of all, if we want to be the, the, top, the best country in the world, we have to be the leaders. We have to start with, with uh, pricing here. And other countries have already started with that leadership. So for example, Sweden, many places in Europe already have price on carbon in the form of carbon tax. We don't have to do a carbon tax to price carbon. Uh, but we have to show leadership and then, then create a, board, a border adjustment. So tax the imports if, if, that, if, if that country has not taxed carbon. So there are actually fixes to, uh, to make this a global policy. So one more question before we get to your slides. I do want you to uh, present them, but um, strikes me that to, um, to get government to adopt policies, which is really the name of the game here, uh, and policies that will work, um, you have to have their attention. You have to have government's attention. And the problem right now is we have a, a pandemic. Um, and if you look at the news, you know, any paper, any paper in the world, the headline is going to have something to do with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. How do you get their attention in a world which is so focused and so distracted on, on COVID uh, when in fact when in fact, this is as much an existential threat as COVID is, in my view, anyway. Uh, I, think, um, I think I sent you an op-ed uh, I did in Florida for Mother's Day. And even though I was focused more on what's going on in Florida, he said, this is a dress rehearsal. The COVID, the pandemic is a dress rehearsal for climate change or for the environmental crisis that we have. Until we realize that we have a broken relationship with nature, we're gonna have more pandemics, we're gonna have future and more often pandemics happening in the world. When people make the connection about climate change, health and social, you're talking about the social racism and social problems right now, it's just a circle and it has to come together. So we have to make everybody understand that climate change is super tied to the pandemic. And now that we are learning from the COVID, the coronavirus didn't see race, didn't see color, didn't see the geographical location. Climate crisis is exactly the same. And it didn't come as fast and furious like the COVID-19, but little by little is killing us. So yes. if whether, is that a health uh, issue because of the air pollution and the cleaner act in, in the government has to take care of their population. I think it's well, also, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we're going to be reminded by the weather soon enough. We're almost, uh, you know, into hurricane season in the summer and the weather will remind us exactly uh, what we have to do here. It'll, it'll, it'll emphasize the priorities as what will happen. David, you were saying something. Yeah, I think it's also a wake up call too. not like what happens when we ignore science. I think um, I mean, well, Hawaii certainly did very well with COVID, very few people. So, so of course in Hawaii um, did very, very well in paying attention to the scientists, but in, in a lot of states we didn't. Uh, we sort of, while other, other countries were hunkering down and, and keeping the cases low and testing, uh, we, we ended up with the most cases in the world. And, and that was from ignoring science. So I, feel like this should be a wake-up call. We should not be ignoring Absolutely. scientists on climate change where every single scientist agrees, at least 99%, that climate change is inevitable and it's going to be a much bigger effect than COVID. We're going to have parts of the country eventually disappearing. It really is very frightening. And when you mix it all together, it's super frightening. So let's, let's look at your slides. Uh, why don't we put the first one up and then you can um, explain it to us and, and tell us the track of your thinking. Okay. 
<clears throat> so this slide here shows where the, the burden of, of storm damages are falling and how the, it's changing over time. You can see, and, and I'll draw your attention to the, the bars on the right, uh, you can see that the graded area is the, is the um, percentage of climate damages being paid by insurance companies. So more and more insurance companies are, are pulling out of liabilities and they're not, they're not covering, the coverage is falling on the, uh, upon the, the US taxpayers. And you see a, a, a bigger and bigger percentage being paid by taxpayers or, or uninsured losses. So that's the American public. And, that, and if you look at that, um, that middle graph, it shows that climate damages uh, double or triple every single decade the past several decades um, as a result of climate change. So we're, as the American public is paying a higher percentage of a higher number. And so it's really, it, it just illustrates how it's hitting us in the, uh, in the wallet. It keeps climbing. It, it makes Al Gore look old fashioned. <laughs> Why don't you go on with the next slide? Um, and this illustrates exactly how many dollars is coming out of the, um, the average American's wallet as, as a, and, and so it's, it's up to almost $1,000 per household per year. And keeping in mind that only half of American households actually pay taxes. If you're a taxpayer, that's $2,000 a year on average coming out of your, your taxes to pay for, for climate damages. So what used to be maybe one and $2 billion um, aid packages from the government on, on is now for, for storm damages. Now you see $50 billion pack, like storm aid being paid on a single storm. Um, so, and that's coming out of your wallet. That's all based on, that's all part of the carbon damages uh, that the fossil fuel companies are not being charged for. You know, you don't have to uh, engage in predictive uh, analysis, um, but it's clear from that chart, it's going to go up further. And it will continue to go up. Yeah. yeah. Okay, how about the next one? And so the next one is a good illustration of how the, um, the damage is compared to the actual fossil fuel company profits. Um, so so we, we think of profits as, as income coming into the, as money coming into the economy, going into the pockets of Americans. Uh, but you see in the last decade, the, uh, the storm damages exceed the profits of the fossil fuel industry. So that, that's like I mentioned in the beginning, that's negative income to the, to the US. We have more. Yeah. Okay. And so I mentioned that 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 if you were to add up the um all the all the damages from various experts, it would be something like two hundred dollars per ton. And so I just wanted to put that in terms of price per gallon. So so you might go uh, fill up your car with gas, and and it may I don't know what it is in Hawaii, maybe four dollars, three or four dollars a gallon. Uh, but for every gallon you you buy, there's an additional two dollars. Of damage being done from the carbon emission. Yeah, we don't and, think of that. And so, um, same with the electricity you use in your in your home. Uh, um, in Florida, we only pay eleven or twelve cents per kilowatt hour, but I think you're you're about triple that here in Hawaii. Um, but for every for every kilowatt hour, if, it, if it's coming, if that energy is coming from 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 coal, for example, uh, that's an additional twenty cents per kilowatt hour. And damage is being done somewhere as a result of climate change. Well, as you as you know, Hawaii is trying to go uh, to green energy, to renewable energy. Been trying to do that for I'd say fifteen years, maybe more, um, and it's made some progress. Um, and we have a number of shows uh, on ThinkTech where we uh, try to track on that progress. Um, problem is that right now, you know, our economy is suffering. Uh, and people are suffering and uh, business ventures and developments and projects, uh, you know, get, get slowed down a little bit. But there is plenty of, plenty of interest and plenty of momentum at every level. So if you're looking for one community where everyone knows the story, or pretty much everyone, uh, about renewables, uh, this, this would be that, that area. Uh, people have been educated here, hopefully. 
uh, hopefully enough to make political will. Um, if we have no more slides, I have some questions for you. We have more slides. Oh, okay. There's just, just one more we can go over quick, and it just shows that in a country like Sweden that has imposed a uh, price on carbon, that it doesn't didn't destroy their economy, that they were able to see uh, consistent economic growth while driving emissions down. And I, and I think to your other point, too, even though the economy is hurting right now as a result of COVID, we, we've got some like 15 to 20 percent unemployment now. So now is the time to stimulate the economy, create jobs in clean energy. So now is actually a great time uh, to, to solve two in one, uh, provide jobs and create a clean economy. To make the transition to a renewable or like to a sustainable world. Yeah. Well, um, you know, um, the question is um, how you change public conduct. You know, every time you look, there's more public. <laughs> every time you look, there are more viewpoints and frankly, more confusion. I mean, I'm talking about not necessarily Hawaii, but uh, the country, maybe the world. Oh, wow. People don't know. They don't know the connection between uh, I mean, the melting of the, uh, the ice caps and the change in the weather and the rise of the sea level. Uh, they don't really make the connection. They don't believe that they can affect those things even if they do make the connection. So, um, you know, really we, what we need is a, is a global effort, a, a global governmental effort to achieve better clarified, rational, appropriate policy, carbon policy. So what would the policy be? If I made you guys the king and queen of the universe, and I gave you, you know, <clears throat> the power to make any policy you wanted, what policy would you enact? Would you proclaim tomorrow? Carbon dividend, I Yeah, I think we're, we're probably in agreement. It's, it's, the carbon dividend is, is really good because it's, it's a carbon neutral, it's not an additional tax. The tax is the polluters. And, and I think that one, I, I think- um, And it gives back to the people. It gives, it gives back, right, exactly. It gives back to the people and it will, um, it'll generate, it'll, it'll generate clean energy just on its own because, because all of a sudden the clean energy becomes more economical. That's where people will go rather than to pay the fee that they're incurring by, by causing pollution. The reality today is that carbon pricing has never been on the forefront of any political party because they all play the game of winner takes it all. So they have to understand first that it has to be a bipartisan issue. It has been a few uh, bills in there, but it never has gotten because both parties want to have it all. They want to, the Democrats want the Green New Deal, which is way too much, way too soon. And then the Republicans don't want government intervention, but at the same time, they don't do anything about it. So. You have to find this bipartisan consensus when Congress and people, political people, think about everybody. I think also the common answer we get from politicians is if it's an important, if it's an important um, uh, topic to the American public, then it's important, it's an important topic to them. And, and I think um, climate change is not high enough on people's list. People are either not aware or denial or don't really understand the connection. And it's, you can see from the slides, it's actually not that scientific. You, if you're a taxpayer, you're paying 2000 a year for, for carbon damages and it's going up. And, and if you're aware of that, and you should be upset with that. And, and if, if, if the majority of, of Americans want that to be addressed as the number one issue, then policymakers will make it that their number one issue. I, I totally agree. I, I th the most important question that a, a constituent of somebody running for office is, what is your position on climate change? What is your position on carbon policy? What is your position on making this a sustainable planet? Um, and I don't think that question is asked often enough. It should be asked every single, every single time. And every, every candidate for office should be able to answer that. And you should judge that candidate on, on, on the answer. 
Otherwise, we just yeah, never the get answer is education. And like you were saying, Hawaii is very highly educated on renewables, on climate change. We have to share that with every state in the United States and globally as well. And at the beginning of this administration, we finally did something that all the countries agree, and it was the Paris Accord, and we had some goals there. Unfortunately, we pull out of the Paris Accord, but you have to have a global consensus because just like a social and health and economy, everything is tied up and it's going to affect us all. Absolutely. The other, the other uh, point I would ask you about is, uh, is the press, the media. You know, the media can also ask candidates questions. They can ask them for their platforms on things. They can in encourage policies or at least inquire into what, the, what that candidate would, would adopt as a policy. Uh, do you think the media is doing enough on this? Uh, I think you already know how I feel about it. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think one of the issues here is it's become so politicized. I think that the media, the media does have some coverage, but they're afraid it's being perceived just by mentioning the, the topic of climate change as, as being one, one side of the aisle or the other. So it really, we need, really need to change the perception uh, that it's not a political question, it's a scientific reality. Mm -hmm. We have some meteorologists that are talking about it now. And I feel like people, uh, they listen to the person that gives them the news every night. And we should start with the news. If it's something you talk about it every day, people are gonna pay attention to it. So to answer your question, I don't think the media is doing enough in an issue as important as climate change. Yeah, uh, don't be surprised. I agree with you totally. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing is the schools. Now the problem with the schools, young kids, and I have seen this myself, young kids, you know, grade schoolers and all that, if you tell them about saving the planet, if you tell them about climate change, they take the point. It's remarkable how, 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 uh, how quickly they get the message on this. The problem is they're less than 10 years old and they're not gonna be holding office for a while. They're not gonna be in charge for a while. In fact, it may take decades before those kids that you teach today are in a position to do something about this. So it's a delay problem it's, and it's time that we don't have. We don't have that time. We have to act more quickly. So what would you say, you guys, David, Tice, what would you say to the schools, to the educational system, not only um, you know, here in this country, but around the world as to how to, you know, how to make every one of those kids in every grade take this seriously and be ready to go out and change things? You know, Italy already have it in their curriculum, and the curriculum in elementary, uh, middle, and high school. I think, again, the government has to make it something that has to be, um, how do you make it, obligatory? Right. right, it should be an important topic in school because it's, a, it's an important issue and it's, it should be part of science. Um, I think teaching kids is extremely important because we're going to be solving this problem for uh, for several decades, and um, um, also kids may bring it to the attention of parents. And it is, and right. So, yes, kids talk to their parents, and their parents get educated too. Yeah. You know, one thing that strikes me is that we live in a time when, in COVID, everybody talks about reimagining things, reimagining our way of life, our uh, world order, reimagining government, reimagining re social justice, you know, changing it all. And if you see those people, you know, who are demonstrating, um, you know, over the past month or so, um, that's what they want. They want a better world. And I think it's really important that we fold this issue in for them. I think they will see it. But we have to keep it at a high priority for them. It's just as important as every other issue, if not more important. Um, because it, you know, it's ultimately existential. So you guys are a, a great team. You have created this a few years ago, and even in my limited observation of how you've done, you've expanded your reach, you've expanded your 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 outreach, your your writing, your 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 your, your newsletters, and your articles and your research. It's really amazing. You have done really an, an enormous amount of outreach on the subject. 
Um, I want to ask you though, and, and it's a private foundation, which is really a great, a great compliment to your dedication. Where are you going with this? Right now, it's it's impressive, it's admirable. But where are you going? What 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 are the next few years you expect to do in Volo Foundation? Well, I think that right now, Volo, because like you said, we're reinventing ourselves and everybody's reinventing. We're going more into the media, into the ads on TV. We have PSAs, mostly creating awareness, mostly educating not only the kids, but educating the adults, mostly telling them that they have to get involved as constituents, as you say, learning about the candidates, learning what they stand for, learning because it's too easy to blame everything also on the government when we are the ones that vote when we are the one that asks for certain representative in our in, in our in our little part of where we live and then we we tell them oh they're not good enough well you voted for him so learn about that candidate ask and also get involved why don't you why don't you run for office jay yeah, exactly. Uh, so, David, we're almost out of time. I want to ask you to, um, you know, say, provide us with the message you want to leave. Uh, not only the people of Hawaii, but, you know, uh, our, our uh, talk shows go far beyond Hawaii. Uh, what would you say to people um, to ask them to, you know, keep aware, be more aware, uh, adopt policies that will incentivize, uh, you know, uh, incentivize actions that will save us from climate change what would you say to them what is your message that you want to leave with them how would they demand that of, uh, demand of your politicians that they have a solution or a proposal to solve uh, to, to decarbonize our society and therefore um, solve climate change um, we, we've got to all demand that we've got to all understand uh, it's hitting us uh, both economically and our health, um, and that if, if we want to, if we want our, our kids to enjoy what we enjoyed as a society, um, we need we need to demand our politicians address this. Yes, and I remember the last time we did a show with you guys, uh, Tice talked about that. She talked about your kids. She talked about uh, how important it is to leave a a world that is livable to them. Uh, and that maybe that's one of the big reasons you guys do what you do about climate change and about Volo Foundation. Uh, it's for your kids. And I remember your comments about that last time, Tice. You want to repeat them for our viewer, viewer audience? I always say they are my motor. They, that, they are the reason we do everything we do. And you want to preserve future generations and you want to make them uh, leave them um, uh, an environment in a world they can live in. You guys are great. Thank you so much. Uh, Tice Vogel, David Vogel, thank you for coming around. I hope you enjoy your time in, in Hawaii and I hope we talk again soon. And uh, we do admire the work you're doing. Aloha. Thank you, Jay. Thank, thank you for